They might not like it. There's going to be find blood out. everywhere. <laughs> there will be blood. <laughs> oh, yes. There, there will, will be, be blood. blood. Also a great opener. <laughs> <laughs> Stout, which is generally my least favorite type of beer. Well, you can have one of those. Oh, we're, we're probably doing both, let's be honest. <laughs> okay. All right, stout. So, actually, I'm trying to think, have I ever actually. No, don't forget. Oh, too late. But it's okay. So, I actually don't know if I ever had Guinness, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Because I've never been a big stout guy. So, I just. So, well, Guinness is I've like the a, godfathers of stouts. Yeah. So. I've done a half and half. Okay. So it was like, at, um, it's where they put like half Guinness and then half something else. Gross. It actually wasn't terrible. I mean, I think I had more like the other beer That's that was like in it. That's like blasphemy though. It's called like a black and tan. It was yeah. at an Irish pub. Yeah. It was like a standard one well, now. To me, it's blasphemy. Sure. Yeah. No, but it is, um, um, it is really popular actually in Ireland. Yeah. I remember that being a big famous drink at uh, the club oh, that I went nice. to all the time. Um, but there's also a snake bite in black which is a black and tan with a shot of um, black currant flavor syrup, whatever you call it, the name is totally escaped me because it's- Sounds terrible. No, it's, not, it's also- it's, <laughs> but Who doesn't want to drink a snake bite in black? Like it's like the coolest name for a drink ever, right? Okay, we'll just call this a snake bite in black and now we're good. <laughs> it's got a name, you're good. <laughs> yeah. So do you know about the proper way to pour a stout? No. Yes, you do. You're just saying that so that I talk. Go for it. Let's see what you got. Um, so I'm a huge fan of stouts and uh, I lived in Ireland for like five years. So, I did not know that. Um, yes. Yeah, so I can tell you that the Guinness that you will have, uh, the further you get outside of Dublin, the worse the Guinness is. It doesn't travel very well. Good to know. So in Dublin, they deliver Guinness pretty much daily to all of the bars. Yeah. Um, and there's a bar, I think the last statistic that I'd heard, which was about 20 years ago now, there was a bar in downtown Dublin for every 100 people in the whole country. Makes so sense. there's bars everywhere. Yeah. And the, you know, here we get woken up in the morning to the garbage trucks. And in Dublin, you get woken mm -hmm. up in the morning to the street cleaners cleaning up the puke from the <laughs> night before and the Guinness delivery trucks. That's Not what you a get stereotype woken. at all. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when Guinness travels in a can, they put that widget in it, which is that little sort of plastic ball that you hear rattling around after you empty the can. So the proper way to pour a Guinness is um, just to dump the whole can in upside down. Like you don't pour it sideways the way that you would with a lager because it's not carbonated, it's not fizzy, so you don't need to. Okay, so the only tough thing about doing that with these glasses is they're not quite big enough to fit a full tall can. So you have to stop. Yes. Yeah, so or have overflow. A, yeah. So let's see so, how we do. Yeah. First though, I should do the intro for the show. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, hurry. <laughs> Welcome to the latest episode of Over a Pint, which you've probably already seen a bit of the show already, because we just did an intro already after we started, because we're awesome like that, and I have a really good plan here when I do these things, super organized, as you can tell. Uh, this week, I'm really excited to have good friend Sandra Kirkland on. So for those who don't know you, who are you? Uh, I'm a person. Um, I'm a, they all need to know. <laughs> I, I, was, I was like an 11 year realtor in the Oakville, sort of Halton, Milton, Mississauga surrounding area. Um, I was definitely one of those realtors that liked to travel and I traveled very far outside of my, outside of my, my main area. For this deal you did away? Picton or Cherry Valley, which is just outside of Picton, just this side of Picton. How many hours is that? Two and a half. It's not bad, I've seen no. it worse. Uh, it was my best friend, so that was my excuse. She knew that I didn't know anything to do with yeah. the area, and we actually had the time of our lives, not only just driving out there together, but then looking at houses together, so. Um. I did have a client one time who asked me to go to Thunder Bay for his mom. Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, um, no. no? And he's just like, I'm like, I can refer you to someone locally, I know some people through the network. Yeah. And he goes, no, no, like, we trust you. I'm like, but I don't know anything. So like, they trust I'm, me to find a realtor for you. Yeah. yeah. And he's just like, I don't care about the local knowledge. I just trust you to take care of my mom. And he's like, we'll even pay for your flights. And I'm like, I'm not going to Thunder Bay. <laughs> pay for your flights. Yeah, I don't know. Like, he was insane. ready to pay for flights, have me up, like, put me up in a hotel. But isn't it nice to have loyalty like that, oh, though? Oh, it's great. But yeah, it's really cool. Um, Did you do the deal? No. No, you didn't. No, Good for you. Not a Good chance. for you. I'm not, going, I'm not like joining the board. Yeah. And like going through all Thunder Bay. Yeah, yeah. Plus, that's just asking to get sued. Okay, so back to me. Yeah. <laughs> Attention on her. <laughs> um, so at the end of 2017, I stopped selling and became a managing broker. 
um, for my brokerage in Mississauga. So now I run a branch in Mississauga by Erin Mills Town Centre. We've got about 120 give or take realtors, um, part of a larger network of one of the largest brokerages in the GTA, which is Royal Page Corporate, Royal Page Real Estate Services, oh, so LTD, period, brokerage. brokerage, yes. So let's, uh, let's try this upside down pour. Yes. See what happens. Whoa. So just dump it. There you go. And you can feel the widget working. I don't think I opened mine the whole way. No, so we're going the slow the pour, which will help with not spilling it everywhere. It's okay, you're getting, ooh. Oh, I get you a little bit. <laughs> I'll blame the dog. No. <laughs> So you, once again, you can't see her, but Nala is in this episode. Yeah, when you late. see my hand moving down here yeah. under the table. <laughs> <That is perfect>. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> That's a dog. <laughs> um, I'm also suffering from the tail end of the cough from hell. So if I'm coughing into my sleeve today, I'm pop I promise I'm not I'm contagious. Same that way. Yeah. Same Probably with your beer. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you know how you can see like the stout settling after you pour it, which is yeah. kind of like that reverse sort of, it's really mesmerizing. Um, there's a common myth um, that you have to pour Guinness in stages. Um, but it is actually, well, it's not really a myth because Guinness actually said that that's how you had to do it, but it's pure marketing. It was pure marketing to set beer apart from other beer or set Guinness apart from other beer, that there was a proper way to pour it where you fill up the glass two thirds and then you wait until it settles and then you fill up the rest. I do love things like that. It doesn't actually do yeah. make any difference to the you beer. Know, my favorite thing like that in marketing is toothpaste that you actually only need about that much but they wanted people to order more of it more, more often. So they started doing commercials where they did a lot. And so people started copying that. Oh, with the swirl. So people started doing like four, four to five times what you actually should because of those commercials. Wow. So that they ordered more toothpaste. Wow. And that's all it was, is they just wanted people to use up the tubes quicker. We actually need about like that much. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Just classic marketing move. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that's why they say like for kids, like you're probably, you know, brushing Hannah's yeah. teeth on a regular basis. Oh, she's that it's, doing it herself. Like it's a smear. Oh, lucky you, my daughter no. is not, but I don't really let her. Yeah, we, it's like half herself, half like she just sucks on the thing. <laughs> yeah, and, so, and then you finish up. Yeah, so yeah. like, well, it's a Paw Patrol, like brush. With so, the timer on it? No, but I basically like, I'm like, I'll take it away if you don't brush. So then she'll get in there and start brushing and then right at the end and just like open your mouth and then I'll just do like a quick once over yeah. just to make sure because yeah. she's definitely missing. Yeah. <laughs> she still has sugar bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well cheers. She doesn't get much sugar. Slancha, as they say in Ireland. There you go. That's, That's a great way to break your fast. Yeah. That's just the perfect start to a day. Yes. I've been out of Ireland for so long that this actually tastes good. Yeah. But when I first moved home from Ireland, I couldn't drink this. I had to drink Kilkenny as a close second. I do like Kilkenny. Because it tastes so much different in Dublin than it does here. It's good yeah. I haven't been to Ireland. I've they didn't been... have any Kilkenny at your beer store, otherwise I would have got one. Really? So yeah, so sorry. They're out. Surprised. Yeah, they're out. Maybe it was in the different sections. There's two sections. Oh, beer. well then maybe it was in the... So it's oh, not wait, in the section the where the red, I went to the beer store. Oh, so I always go to the LCBO. Oh, Because okay. they got better craft beer selection there. Right. So they have like a whole like fridge of just craft beer. Oh, nice. So I always go there instead. Oh. Plus I don't generally buy them in a bulk to go to the beer store because normally you get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. don't drink beer outside of the show to be honest. <laughs> don't you? Like... There's the odd time, but because I'm trying to lose weight, right? <laughs> beer is the worst thing right. for that. So I go to like straight whiskey or scotch or okay. something like that. Okay. Yeah. So it's funny, like I don't. So you can't really beer. do like a pint of scotch though. So like you can't really apply that to over, over a pint. Yeah. yeah, you can put in like a little bit. It's good. But not everyone. Like we've done, we haven't done it on scotch, but like we did old fashions for an episode and oh. done a few things like that. I missed that so one. That's Tony Joe. Oh, okay. Another Lorg. So yeah, we're just slowly working the way through the whole Lorg community. The League of Real Estate Geeks. Geeks. Oh, we had Tony on, so but yes. hour of the... I saw Tony's so, yeah. the other day. So, yeah, we mentioned it once or twice. Yeah. So Sandra's another member of Lorg. If you saw Tony's, that makes sense. Otherwise, just know we're geeks. Yeah. I yeah. forget what my official title is, but I just basically call myself the Queen of Goth, because that's sort of what I am. Yeah, I think mine was just founder, founding member. Not you, founder, you but founding like a, member. You, do, so when, how did Tony in, um, like initiate you into the group? Oh, he just added me. Oh, I, so yeah, I, I had to answer one. still testing questions. No, it was day one when he decided to start it. I was at the time working at Remax, and so I was like the trainer for Remax, and then him and I just like at conferences had had some geeky conversations. 
Um, so when he decided to start it, he just like added the people he knew were geeky. Right. Um, me being one of them. So yeah, he just kind of added me and it went from there. I don't actually know how actually well I would do on the test. <laughs> like I am geeky, <laughs> well, but I'm not like- It was easy. Like it wasn't yeah. like, you know, when was Spider-Man created? Like it wasn't, yeah. you know, like that. But he, he sort of asked me, um, I forget even exactly what the question was, but it was like define your, or what does it mean to be a geek or something like that? Yeah. So I gave him some kind of like existential answer <laughs> of like, you know, whatever. I think it was similar yeah. to actually what he said when he was on your row for a pint. Um, and then he kind of reiterated and he said, no, no, no like for you, for Sandra, like what yeah. is your geek? And I was like, oh, I'm a goth, like demonology, vampirology, zombies, yeah. like that's, that's my thing. And he was like, okay, you're in. And then it was easy. as easy as that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, he just added me. <laughs> you're lucky. Uh, yeah, it yeah. worked. But you know, you're there since the beginning and then I had to delete that account and get added back, but I didn't have to go through a test to be added back and we're good. Oh, well that's good. Yeah. You're very lucky. You must be yeah. a preferred member. Probably. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> we also get him leads, so. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I got leverage. Yeah. <laughs> I do nothing with to for Tony or with Tony except fight with him on the internet. It's, it's a classic move. Yes. But now, so on that topic, you used to fight a lot more. I did. So what was that shift? Like, why did you stop? You used to get a lot more of those arguments online, I noticed. Yeah. Um, I think it was like a culmination of a lot of different things. Um, most importantly, it was sort of the shift in my job. Um, you know, I went from just being responsible for myself and I didn't necessarily care, um, you know, how I came across to certain people on the internet yeah. to, um, you know, I think, you know, what it was, was when Tim Hudak was first hired as the new CEO for Aria yeah. and he sort of went on a road show where he was, um, asking to meet with specific people in the industry who seemed to have yeah. a really good knowledge of the industry so that he could kind of be brought up to speed by the people that work at, and he, um, called me and said that he had understood that I was somebody that he needed to meet in his first couple of months as the new CEO of Aria. And I was ego like, boost? Yeah, well, yeah, like I was like, no, oh my God. So he'd said, you know, and all of the people that I've been talking to about who were influencers in the industry, um, your name kept coming up over and over again as somebody yeah. who was both extremely knowledgeable in the landscape and the temperature of the industry, as yeah. well as somebody who is actually an influencer. And, no. you know, when Tim Hudak calls you, you know, a, a thought influencer or mm -hmm. uh, an industry influencer then you you kind of really start to change your self-perception so next thing you're gonna be a guru and then just maybe. gonna maybe go up the ladder of cliche it, terms yeah and, yeah and then what's at yeah. the top like what am i striving for here president president of <laughs> the real estate industry the world oh like mr president from the lego movies yeah i've not seen so. those you haven't seen lego movies no come on kids aren't there yet but who cares? Like, we'll you need them. to just watch that for you, not for the kids. I've heard they're good. They're excellent. Right now, we're in a big Frozen, Lion King, back to Frozen, back to Lion King stretch. So that's kind of our life right now, with Paw Patrol thrown in in the middle. Yeah, we're sort of starting to come out of Paw Patrol now, but we are um, knee-deep into My Little Pony. Mm. So do you understand bronies? <laughs> why they like the show. <laughs> so my my beloved and amazing yeah. and an incredibly amazing husband mm -hmm. is a stay-at-home dad. Um, so he is almost a brony. Like just yeah. by sort of like having to because he spends all day yeah. with our daughter who loves my little pony. So So he's um, into it? Yes, but not in the inappropriate <laughs> sense. Only in the dad sense. I don't sense. think bronies are in an inappropriate sense. I think they just like the show. I don't know, have you seen some of those YouTube videos? No. Okay. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> but it comes back to I wanna like when I have free time, if that ever happens, start a podcast called The Fringe where I interview people on the fringes of society and I want episode one to be like a brony. It's so like sit down with a brony and just deep dive. I don't think you'd be able to deep work. dive unless you had an understanding of the ponies. Like, do you even oh, know no, who Pinkie Pie is? No, but I would have to do research, <laughs> right? So I binge watch My Little Pony, read their forums, and then sit down and oh have a discussion. Gosh. Oh my god! Learn. I about will the other subscribe people. to that. It would be entertaining. Yes, it and would be. And there's so many, and because I, I just like learning about different types of people. So I think like the research side of that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, let's dive deep into like that internet forum. And go deep. That could be. That could yeah. have disastrous consequences. Oh yeah. Like, there's no <laughs> way that I'm not coming out of at least one episode of that show scarred for life. No, because then your yeah. next step outside of that is moving into the furries. 
And we all know where that could go. Yeah, that would definitely come up at one point. I feel like you gotta save any like sex related ones for at least season two. Cause then <laughs> you're just diving too much into that and you get pigeonholed. Like yeah. how entertaining would it be to be like, let's find someone who's like a sex worker for like 50 years. Like find like someone who's like a veteran of the industry, but you can't do that at the start. No. Or you get pigeonholed as that. Yes. That would be a weird researching one to do. <laughs> yes, it but would. But it would be wildly entertaining. Yes, it yeah. would. So this is a weird place to take in this episode. That was a, that was a tangent. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if that makes the final cut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really exposing a lot about my yeah. knowledge and interest in the underworld these days. Yeah, oh, it's great. <laughs> so speaking of being a, a thought influencer and a leader yeah. in the industry, I'm not proving myself to be one of those right now. Sure you are. Mm. You have interest in things and can talk on a variety of topics like a true leader can. Oh, well, that's good. See? I have vast knowledge outside of yeah. my own blinders. I yeah, guess, right? okay. not tunnel vision. Cool, I like you. So it's all about the T-shape. Right. So you can talk about a lot, but you just know a lot about one specific That's piece. true. And I do live, eat, and breathe this industry. Yeah. I really do. So you, Sometimes yeah. I wonder how healthy it is. Yeah, I don't know. Because it is like it's it, like it is a hobby that I'm lucky enough to get paid for, but yeah. I do a lot of things involved in the industry that I actually don't get paid for at all. Like what? Um, well, like volunteering and organized real estate. So what are you doing there? Um, well, I spent two terms as a director of the Oakville Milton District Real Estate Board when mm -hmm. I was selling real estate and working in Oakville, which was fantastic. I had such yeah. a good experience there. And now I'm serving a two-year term as the director of the Mississauga Real Estate Board. I just spoke there. Yes, you did. And I missed it because I was sick, so I apologize for missing that AGM. You, it's like you never heard me before, though. So. No, like a bajillion times. A bajillion times. Every day in the yeah. elite group. No, but I do like to go out and support you. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'd like to I make sure it. that everybody knows that I know you. Like, that's, yeah. you know, it's self-serving. Yeah. It's, it's bringing up by association. <laughs> yeah. But you're the influencer you're getting called, so really it's the other way around. I'm bringing up by knowing you, apparently. Well, it's, it, it, you're the it, one getting called from the big wigs. It's mutual. Yeah. It's mutual. I I had to bribe Tim with beer <laughs> to get that meeting because he was the first guest on the show. Right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I do self-serve for him. It's pretty easy to bribe <laughs> Tim with beer. <laughs> it, it wasn't hard. No. It, really <laughs> it, it was hard. actually just one call and like five days later I was in his office drinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and he yeah. loves that stuff too, right? Yeah. yeah and he's, oh, a, he's a really fun. cool laid back guy. Yeah. That's actually what I found like the best way to actually meet with someone. Be like, hey, do you want to have a beer and film it? It's work. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, yeah. Is. and now you're getting to the point where people are actually buying beer for you on their way into yeah. your meeting. Oh, so. and I used to have to drive to every episode. Yeah, so and now people are desperate to come to you. Oh, yeah, I don't know. We're going to people driving to Newmarket, which for a lot of people is not close. Yeah. So I, I do enjoy that. And like, I, it's not like I can expense this beer. So this was my contribution yeah, okay. to, to, to you. It's a, it's a work expense. Well, we're not allowed to write off alcohol. No, it's a shame. <laughs> Because I right Especially at 11 o'clock in the morning on a Friday, I'll call. <laughs> like, this is even close to the earliest I feel. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, it is 4 o'clock in Ireland, so... So we're good. Cheers. Cheers. Slasha. Yeah. So this year. Yeah. So we've just never... Oh, pardon me. Um, <laughs> we're cutting that one out. Yeah. <laughs> authentic. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that'll be your intro. So I do normally actually have a trick for that, because you drink enough, you're going to burp. I don't burp. Um, I don't burp. No, I'm like one of those those weird people that doesn't burp. No, I do all the time. So my trick <laughs> is I do this. And burp into burp the glass. Burp into the glass because then it never ends up on camera. <laughs> so you'll notice sometimes the level doesn't change when I go to drink and it's because I'm, I'm just... Or you're not yeah. swallowing. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm just straight going in. Now. Oh, I'm watch now it. sometimes I'll wait and hold it there and then have a little... <laughs> I'm dying. It's tricks of the trade. I'm dying. It's like the newscaster with no pants. You gotta know how to hide what you don't want people to see. Because <laughs> I had one like I'm that. I'm actually crying. Yeah, I had someone on the show who like had a burp. I'm like, oh, can you cut that out? I'm like, you gotta learn the pro move. You just give it a little. I don't need the pro moves because I actually I don't burp. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I don't burp. We're gonna test that theory today. <laughs> I'm gonna check the rest of my Guinness and you'll yeah. see. And then we'll open up the next round. And yes, well, see. I mean, that might be a little bit different, though, because it's bubbly. Now, is it a stout? No, the, Guinness, a that's bottle. the blonde lager, and then yeah. that's... But literally, they're is, both positioned, so I cannot see the name. This is my <laughs> husband's favorite. It's okay. the um, Hop House Lager. Sweet. I think it's called 13, I guess. I've never really kind of yeah. looked at it. Looks like a dead giveaway. And then we've got the Guinness Blonde American Lager. Next, we'll give that a shot. Yeah. Um, so, now, let's go back to more, like, when you started. So... When you started real estate, how long till you got your first deal? Oh, it was like, 
almost a year. But but I was one of those people that um, I guess I was a little bit trigger happy. I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, or trigger shy, I guess is the word. I was trigger shy because I got registered and then I joined um, a, a, real, a real estate brokerage and and then I spent a lot of time and focus on checklists and yeah. listing presentation and buyer presentation and trying to get everything organized, um, building my CRM but not actually doing anything with it. Yeah. And I was I was actually I was really trigger shy and then doing all my articling because of course you have to do like. Yeah four different courses after you get registered in your first two years two, and I'm like three, no I think two. it was three yeah it was three yeah whatever um <laughs> and and then Royal Page Corporate of course has like extensive um new registration training after mm -hmm. you, you you join the brokerage so I was going to all of those courses and then of course I was you know relearning what I just learned in the course and and I, I guess I was trigger shy like I guess yeah. I was kind of afraid to sort of get out there and start doing some stuff so I, I decided that I really wanted to finish all my article courses and get it out of the way develop my brand get it out of the way and then I'd done all that and I thought well Where's the business? Like yeah. I've done my checklists, I've done my CRM. Why are you I've got coming to me? my CRM? What's happening? Yeah. And then, um, and then I started doing open houses yeah. and building my confidence and understanding what kind of questions I was going to be asked. Um, and then a lot of those I failed at the beginning because I didn't know how to answer the questions that people were coming in. Like you just yeah, they don't teach you that, that, right? Like they don't teach you that. Like even even brokerages struggle to really teach you, you know, what kind of questions people are going to ask when they come into your open house. And you, you, the only way to learn is just by application. And yeah, execution. I definitely learned pretty fast that I was terrible at being an agent for a while. Like I knew. Like the forms inside out to the point that like even a couple of minutes in people come to me with like forms questions. Yeah. Like I knew those inside and out. And then like all the issues, like everything, I knew all of it. Mm -hmm. But when it came to like like even little things, I remember my first open house and I was like, Oh god, I wouldn't even hire me. Someone's like, How old is the furnace? And I go, Uh that's a good <laughs> question. I'm Let's like, go look. down and look. Yeah. Let, oh, or you didn't even, even know that you could go down and look at that. Didn't yeah. even think about it. I'm like, I'll follow up with you on that. <laughs> Then they're like going around the open house. The couple other they come up to me. Oh, by the way, the furnace was two thousand and eight. I was like, good to know. <laughs> Whoops, my bad. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna follow up with them because they're not gonna hire me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know exactly. Now, in my defense, I'd been asked an hour before the open house to actually do it because the agent. So you totally weren't prepared. Yeah, like I just like I went in and I just like printed out the data sheet and I was like just sitting there trying to memorize it and I did not remember the no. furnace date. No. But yeah, no, it was. Uh, Quite an embarrassing show, but then what I started but doing is like, oh yeah, especially the first few. Yeah, that was terrible. So it took me six months to get my first sale. Like I did like eight or nine leases in there. Um, but yeah, six months to get my first one, and I had to give fifty percent of the commission to someone else because of a referral. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to drive that an hour sucks. away to get it. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it was an hour outside of my area, which is why they gave me the lead. And then yeah. 50% of that and it was because it was an hour outside it was an area with a very low commission point too So I think my first sale I maybe pocketed 2500. No, and I was like, whew. Yeah, but back then like how long have you been registered? When did you get your license? It was around the same time I did wasn't it like it was like two thousand. Oh, you were earlier weren't you? Oh, you were later? I got my license like six years ago. Is that all? Six or seven at most. So how long did you sell for before you two, two years. years and yeah. then you moved into Integra? Yeah, so I got so I sold so so actually, I just got a Facebook memory today that five years ago, I was an agent teaching an Evernote course at Hallmark because I was we got bought by Remax wow. Hallmark. And that was the last six months of my selling. So a year and a half. So yeah, like six and a half years ago, I got my license. So your career is a lot like mine, where you found out really early that you yeah. enjoyed educating and working with realtors more than you enjoyed working with the public because that's kind of my thing. Yeah, I don't. I didn't like them. Now, I got screwed by a couple of people who were just like shitty people. Um, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I'd leave it there. Yeah. Um, they're not going to watch, but it's no point in rehashing it. No. Um, but yeah, I had a few people who just like were absolutely terrible. It kind of turned me off them a bit. Uh, and I just got really good at the online. And it was all self taught Like I came from construction industry and a history degree. I had no idea what to do online. That's, um, that's quite a juxtaposition yeah. of like <laughs> history degree, construction. Yeah, so There's I was like no so a family business. There. So I got, so originally <laughs> I went to university thinking I'm going to become a lawyer. So I wanted to be a lawyer. I'm like, I did the whole like mock trial club. Like I. What kind I, of lawyer? Criminal. 
Ooh. Yeah, like I love that stuff. Yeah, me too. Um, so I originally, yeah, so I did like mock trial club in high school, and I loved that. Like, and I had so much fun. Yeah, yeah. It. And I like like actual being on like in the mock trial itself. Yeah, I love that. And so I go to this university, and I just got like I was a history degree, so you're doing like 25, 30 page papers, and I just got sick of it. And I'm like, there's gonna be more of that in law school. I'm like, I don't know that I want to keep doing it. And then at the same time, so the family business was concrete for me. So they're like, my brother was taking it over, and he's like, you know, I could use some help. So they basically offered me a job because uh, I'd been working there in the summer, so I knew it, plus trust of being family. And basically the offer they made, I'm like, with between all the perks and all the other stuff, it would have been like 90K a year at day one at a university. And I was like, I'm going to take that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they sent me out west to Calgary to work. And out there, because of labor shortages, it boosted it up even more. So like I was just making a ton of money wow. right out. And then came back. Did was an estimate. I was just looking at blueprints all day, and I hated it. Like you literally just sit there and like you're measuring blueprints out, being like, "This is how much it would cost for us to build that." And then we bought a house because it was making a lot of money. And our agent, I actually really liked her, but I'm like, I could have done a way better job. She cost us the house we actually wanted from a stupid oversight. And then like we actually offered more than the than the offer they took, but she didn't give it to them in time. No. Yeah, so they accepted it like 10 minutes before. And she <sighs> and we, she knew we were sending an offer in for about 15 hours. Oh, that's frustrating. And didn't call the agent to say, we have an offer coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they ended up accepting this one. That's such, um, a, oh, that's such a big yeah. peeve of mine. So I was like, I could do a better job. My wife mm -hmm. goes, prove it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I got my license, and I originally was just doing it on the side. And I met with the, so in our town it was Remax. So I met with them because that was just the brand I knew. Although I interviewed at Royal LePage in Coldwell. And then he's just like, oh yeah, um, if you're going to do this part-time, you're not even allowed to interview people. We don't take part-time people. There's still a lot of brokerages yeah. that do that today. Yeah. And I remember like as an interview at Royal Page, he's like, oh no, that's fine. You can do part-time here. And like the way he was saying it, I'm like, I actually respect the guy so much more who said no part-time. Mm -hmm. And the way he saw it, I was just like, screw it. I'm going to do it. So told my dad I was quitting. <laughs> And, Brutal. Yeah, I just jumped in, and I had a bit of a runway, but I blew that in six months because I like did some of those stupid things where yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I knew online was a thing. Yeah. So I like did the oh I'm gonna pay for this fifteen hundred a month service where I get the exclusive rights to Aurora and get leads online. First lead I ever get. Like a Zillow or a Park Bench kind of thing, like like that. It was. I'm pretty sure they literally just put like crappy ads out there and people filled it. Like I don't even know hundred percent what they're doing. It was terrible. And the first lead I ever got had a max budget of 150000 <laughs> At the time, the cheapest place in Aurora, which is in the Aurora Ghetto. 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 That's fine. Um, <laughs> we won't go there. That's a nickname. <laughs> it's actually fine. You walk through 2 a.m. and like, of course. with cash out. You know, of course. Nothing's going to happen. It's Aurora. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's pretty safe. Um, and they sh like, even there, it was 350000 and she's just like, no, 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 like, if a max budget is 150, I'm like, we're going to have to go pretty far north. She or goes, no, 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 no. Like, she's like, I want to roar a new market. I'm like, you want to rent. <laughs> yeah. And then that was a terrible lead. And there was like a series of leads like that. I eventually canceled. Uh, but like, there's a bunch of things like that that I just blew money on. So I'm like, and at the time I was like blogging and I was door knocking, cold calling. Like I was basically throwing you were everything at the wall and yeah. seeing what stuck. Very little did. No. But the first couple deals I ever got were besides like, so like I started getting a ton of leads online, but they were all pretty far out. So I was following up with them. In the meantime, I'd been working the relationships in my office a lot. The idea at the time was all agents are, at the time were in my office, are pretty old. So I was like, they're all gonna retire soon -ish. Maybe they'll business. give me yeah. business. So I was like, I was thinking of like five years out type of thing. But they just started giving me the leads they didn't want. Mm -hmm. um, so my first couple of deals were actually just referrals from agents in my office because I've been working that. Amazing. And I actually just enjoy doing that. Yeah, yeah. And then my broker came to an open house and I was, I have terrible writing. I hate people like trying to read people's writing. So I was like Googling, how can I like have a sign in on an open house on my iPad? So I discovered Open Home Pro. So I was like, all right, well, let's do that. Figured it out how it worked. And my broker came into my open house and he's like, what is this? This is cool. I like this. And he's like, can you teach people in the office how to like 
do this? I'm like, sure. I assume this would be like at the sales meeting, I'd do like a 10 minute, here's what you do. He booked a two hour <laughs> course for <laughs> Open Home Pro. Yeah. And like 15 minutes in, I was done. Yeah. Like it's Open Home Pro, it's sign up, questions, put it in front of people. You get emailed a report at the end of the meeting. Like, Done. Yeah. And then, so it just turned into like, they started asking other questions. And like, I, did, I, I was using Evernote a lot then and different things like that. And it just kind of I still love Evernote. Oh, I use it every day. Yeah, I still um, love Evernote. I don't organize it the same way because the search function so good. Now it's just like pure brain dump. Yeah. But yeah, I use it every day. Yeah. Um, yeah I keep I mean, trying to use a CRM to like keep track of the conversations that I'm having with my realtors. Mm -hmm. And I keep resorting back to Evernote. Oh, I love Evernote. But yeah, like if you don't have like, like our CRM is Infusionsoft. We don't really use it on the sales side. And we just right. hired Steph who does our sales. She's not even using the CRM side of Infusionsoft because it sucks. We use it for the marketing automation. She right. actually started up, I think it was Zoho. Right. To use that. Yeah. Because um, it has what she needs and it integrates with Infusion. I was trying to use HubSpot as my CRM for... Yeah, I've, I've tested it, it, but... I prefer it now just for the open tracking. That's all I use yeah. it for. Yeah, I, the the ours is entirely just the marketing automation, and then for us, differently, is the e-commerce side of it, because we got to take sales online, stuff like that. Yeah. And Infusionsoft is the only one I can customize the tax, because that's actually a huge challenge for us, is because we deal business all over. Like, if someone buys something from us in Alberta, we we're supposed to charge their tax rate. Right. But... And only Infusionsoft that we found can actually adjust based on where the person oh, is putting I see. their address in. I see. So like Sam Card, which is what we use for a lot of things, because it can do some really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I just have to like, I basically eat the tax now because we like look at where the person fun. was and then so like we just like raise the prices a bit overall to account but, for that. Yeah, yeah, but generally I'm just eating yeah. the cost of the taxes now. Yeah. Um, but because of the, some stuff Sam Card can do. Like there's some cool things we're gonna be like, one we're gonna test is a pay what you want checkout. So we'll literally just like put it in and be like, you can literally, as long as it's at least a penny, you have to pay something, but you can get like a 10 day trial for whatever you wanna pay. And- How do you think that's gonna go over? So I've always thought that it'd be terrible. Um, but a buddy of mine in a networking group I'm in for marketers has tested it. He's like, people were paying more than what I was actually going to charge. Well, I remember like it was a big thing when Radiohead did that with one mm -hmm. of the albums that they released shortly after like Napster became the biggest thing in the world. And yeah. Radio said, Radiohead said, here's our new album, mm -hmm. pay what you want, whether it's you can take it for free mm -hmm. or you can pay us. And I think they said that they made like a surprising amount of money, yeah. way more than what they'd expected because yeah, people, people were willingly, willingly so, paying for the album. The system I have, like you have to <laughs> at least put in a penny. So like you can literally pay a penny. But you have to put in something. Hmm. So I'm going to actually do a split test. So one version of what we're going to do is going to be twenty seven dollars, and then one is going to be a pay what you want, and we're going to see what which one people take. That's like, like the best AB test ever. Yeah, I'm pretty excited because like twenty seven bucks, almost anyone should. Yeah. But then pay what you want. I'm curious if people will pay like a penny. Then no, there definitely will be people who yeah. just like put a penny down. But I'm curious how high, like what the highest number that someone takes is, and I'm just curious when that like psychology perspective of it of like how high is someone willing to go on it yeah and see that's interesting yeah. a lot of fun with testing stuff let us know i will down but in the comments yeah here there there somewhere <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny going back to to like youtube and and online videos and stuff um kids today are, are so involved in kids today Kids today. Old man yells at clouds. Such a yeah, I'm such a Clint Eastwood. Get off my lawn. Um, kids today are like they're so into you know the YouTube things and and my 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 four year old she turned four in February and she loves people like Jojo Siwa who's got such a big presence on you. You will you you'll hear about her soon enough. Um, you know and and Ryan's toy review. Ryan is that like the little kid who makes millions. Yes, he's okay. the top. Yeah. He's got the most subscribers out of any YouTuber ever in the world, and he's like an eight-year-old kid because right. um, he reviews toys and stuff like that. Um, but they all talk about, you know, increasing their engagement on YouTube. So yeah. you'll all hear them at some point over the course of their video saying, let me know down in the comments or be sure to yeah. subscribe. So my daughter now, who, of course, is still working on emerging language at, at four yeah. years old, three and a half, four years old, um, we see her running around and mock playing. Like she'll have a couple of toys and she'll be like, I, I don't like what you're doing. Stop hurting me. And like they're fighting. Yeah. And then she'll be like, let me know how you feel in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so funny to hear like a 
four-year-old just like saying yeah. this kind of language and technology, That's which is so foreign awesome. to us, right? Yeah. Oh, my daughter, like she's two and a half, can already like flip the camera and take selfies and stuff like that. And you're like, it's crazy. Yeah. It's insane. Like we used to do with yeah. actual cameras yeah. back in the day, the digital, right? The digital camera was revolutionary. Back yes. Then, yes. Because you know, then you could delete all the terrible ones. Yes. And you didn't yeah. have to pay. Yeah. And find out a month later that that one shot didn't work. Man. <laughs> Times have changed. Know, and how old are we that we're talking about that now? 32? No, not 32 yet. But... You're not 32 yet? You're really 31? Are you, like, are you lying? Summer. No, July, I'll be 32. You're lying. Now I feel really old. 87. So I've got nine years on you. There you go. I'm a 70s child. So are you 40 this year? No, I was or born in 78. Year. So I no. turned 41 uh, no. last month. So what did you do for your 40th? Um, we had just bought a house ourselves, so yeah. we didn't have a lot of money Classic. to do anything. Yeah. Um, so my uh, three of my girlfriends that I met from mommy groups, because you know the importance of mommy groups. Um, I do not personally. No, but, but you understand yeah. from a third. I am in a dad group, but it's pointless. <laughs> Those are fun though. Ours isn't. Oh. Someone okay. started like a dads of York region thing. Oh. Well, the Burlington dads is like epic. Yeah. Like, if there's anybody here watching that's like a guy that has kids living in the Burlington oh. region, Burlington dads group, they've got a logo. Yeah. They do events oh, with like printed material. Like it's it's a thing. I was thing. hoping it would be something like that. Yeah, that would be cool. Thing. So ours was like, it's just like somebody started it. It's like half just people promoting like their businesses. And then the only like engagement there ever was was when Gillette came out with that ad. And one guy made a comment about like how I'm never using Gillette again. And in one of my rare, I actually hit enter on the comments because I always just make replies yes. and delete the yes. comments and never actually do it. Yes. I replied um, and got into it with him about like, no, like toxic masculinity is real. Like it sure is. Like it's a thing. Like, yeah. You can't even deny it. It is a thing. But he had that mistaken one where it was like, he just thought they were going for all men instead of just, you know, the one on the fringe. Right. And I was like, and so like I got into it pretty good with him and then eventually I just left them. So, okay, so let's talk about that. So that's a okay. good topic to talk about, I think, oh, yeah. on exactly over right. time. Let's talk about that. Sure. So, I, full disclosure, I grew up as an only child in an affluent family. Mm -hmm. um, I, my mom was a stay-at-home mom and a home manager and she was excellent at what she did. And my dad was working his way up the corporate ladder from yeah. a nothing into um, when he retired, he was in SVP status at a multinational pharmaceutical company. So. Mm -hmm. um, and I was an only child and I n was never afflicted with, you know, I, I, full disclosure, I was terribly privileged. Um, Me too. <laughs> right. I, I, I feel very lucky and proud of, of that fact, no. right? Um, but I was never afflicted with that, you know, um, you're going to be stopped because you're a woman or you're not, you're not going to have um, as many opportunities as you might have if you were a man in business. No. Um, and I sort of skated through like the first like three decades of life. I yeah. sort of skated through that. Um, and I never really did find that oppression that women get in the workplace. Yeah. And I had some great successes. Like I wasn't like you where I'd gone to university and had, you know, a family business that I could yeah. have, you know, delved into. I didn't have the opportunities that you had, but I was able to sort of do whatever the hell I wanted and was yeah. never left at risk of not being able to afford to buy a liter of milk. Yeah. No, I never, like the only thing that literally the only I definitely saw the advantages of having the right family and connections because literally every job before I got into real estate, every single job except one summer job in university got because of family. Right. So like I worked at a golf course, my grandfather owned it, like things like that. Like, or and see, I never had that, but I was always taught growing up that if you work really hard, you'll get whatever yeah, you want. And I never saw and like, and I, it never even crossed my mind that women had bigger issues growing up because like, I remember specifically in a lot of like my lunch school, especially like grade six is when it really hit home is they sat me right between the two smartest people in our grade, which were two women. And they were the ones who were like, if they got a hundred, but there was a bonus question. So they didn't get 105. They were pissed off. Wow. And I was like a, at that time, like a sixties kind of student. And I just had like these two women who just kicked my ass at everything. So it just never occurred to me until like, I think it was not even until university that I really started picking up that women had a tougher time than men at things. Yeah. And just, never even noticed but but i i do also find that you know my privilege and my my upbringing and my experiences aside that that um if you if you're willing to commit and you're willing to work really hard mm -hmm. um no level of whatever privilege you come from or whatever thing was boosting you when you first got started can really stop you from achieving those goals yeah. 
that's part of why I left the family business too, is I was kind of feeling that a lot of what I have wasn't necessarily deserved. Right. Like when you go back and look, like yeah. it probably, some of it was, I mean, there's no way I should have necessarily gotten the salary and everything I did right out of school. But it was in order to maintain with, that, you would have had to have like, yeah, fulfilled. Like, and when I like look back, I was like, okay, that's actually in line roughly with what other people were making. Mm -hmm. I just instead of having to interview for the job, just got it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of why I got into the real estate industry. I'm like, I kind of need to do it myself. Um, I did all right. Done okay. Yeah. Um, well, and it's and it, yeah. it really is about working hard and finding your vein too, yeah. right? Um, you know, and I think that's the key. So going back to like our, our history and our experiences in selling real estate, like for me, it was, I, I spent 11 years selling real estate, but that wasn't my primary focus. No. Um, I was lucky enough that I could, you know, just afford to consistently make, you know, 80 to hundred thousand dollars year over year in real estate, um, by flying by the seat of my pants, which is what no. the vast majority of realtors today do. No. But that afforded me the opportunity to spend more time working at what I preferred to do, which was the volunteer unpaid stuff of organized no. real estate, mentoring new realtors in the office and working with realtors. No. And, you know, there was a big trigger for me that, that really made me realize that selling real estate wasn't going to be in my long term future, no. which was, I was mentoring a new realtor, um, still a really good friend of mine to this day. And she called me one day and she said, um, yeah, I'm going into multiple offers. It's my first time prevent presenting multiple offers. Mm -hmm. I'm nervous as hell. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, can you help me? And it was like a Thursday evening. I'd gone home already. I'd taken my pants off. I'd settled in for the night and she called me and said, can you help me? And I'm like, I'll be right there. Throw on some clothes, rush out. Yeah. So excited. Like I'm stoked and excited just to help her do this thing and you know i spent a couple of hours with her setting her up and coaching her and mentoring and getting her into the into the thing she didn't end up winning that offer but like yeah. the, the fire that i had in helping her do that and then the next day was a friday and i woke up late because i'd been up late the night before helping this this realtor do this thing and i had some two million dollar buyer clients that i'd been working with who i liked a lot they were yeah. great they were ready to buy so you know i'm, I'm close to a fifty thousand dollar commission check with these buyers and um they call me the next day and they say, oh, this new house has just come up on the market. It's just come up in our auto search. We absolutely love it. We need to go see it tomorrow morning. Can you take us to go see it tomorrow morning? And I went, oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's great. How's 11 o'clock? You know, and I, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. And that to me was this trigger going, why was I so excited to go out and help this person in her multiple offer where I was getting paid nothing. Yeah. And I'm annoyed with having to go out and open yet yeah. another door for a $50,000 paycheck. Yeah pretty good money. You know, like <laughs> Most really people's money. annual salary. Totally. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was like a real trigger for me that like, you know, working with the client and helping them buy and sell property was okay, but it yeah. wasn't my true calling. It wasn't my true yeah. personal passion in this industry. I just loved like solving the challenges of like online stuff and like figuring out like what messaging made people do things and like that side of it. And I really enjoyed that. And then, that, so it was funny too, like in Growing up, if you had to make me present in front of people, I'd just take the zero and sit in the back and hide. Yeah. And then I started... That like, was never me. <laughs> no, I, was, I was like, well, like, I hide from everything. But it was always because I never... It was actually funny. So where I started getting like 90s in school was then I... Because I always thought when I got like 60s that everything was harder than it actually was. So like when I'd look at an answer and I'd know the answer right away, I'd be like, yeah. oh, it can't be that. That's too easy. Yeah. And then I do like a convoluted thing and fail. Yeah. And then when the switch like went in my head, I'd be like, oh no, it actually is that easy. Yes. And then I started doing great. And then you just do it. Yeah. And then yeah. I started speaking and like doing little things like mock trial club, which was hilarious uh, and so much fun. Um, so I started like doing a little bit more speaking, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then in real estate, cause I started doing that. And then when I did that, the first one on like open home pro it went over really well and another one and then another one. And I just kind of went off from there. And, and then suddenly you enjoyed speaking. speaking. I, I know. And you're really good at it. I'm technically a professional speaker. Yeah. Like, it, you know, I wanted to originally be a, one, at one point I wanted to be like a stand-up comic, but I never actually I could see felt, that. So I'm good, like reactionary yeah. with comedy. I'm not great at playing Planet. jokes. So but I've there's never, some, there's some excellent comedians that yeah. like have like a like a random plan, but then deviate way so, off of that, and that becomes even funny. Like of Billy Connolly is fake. Is that <coughs> they're so good it seems random? 
That's true. It's not. Yeah, like you can it see Billy Connolly planned. planning to go off of his path. Yeah, those are all planned tangents. His joke of saying, oh, yeah. that was a tangent, was... Yeah, like, because I, I've studied, because even from professional speaking, I study comics and what they do. Like, I study a lot of, like, Seinfeld stuff. And mm -hmm. there's some, like, behind-the-scenes ones where he was even talking about, he's like, what really makes a comic great is to make it seem like everything he said was made up on the spot. And, but he was like showing his process where like he had a sentence that was a one joke and he was sitting there. He's like, there's too many syllables right here. And yeah. like he's down to that point of like, he is counting out syllables and finding a way to remove syllables because it will make the joke funnier if it's a, that one syllable shorter. So I, okay. like we're all at risk of that, of getting too obsessed with our job that we get yeah. so overwhelmed with the minutia that you forget about the bigger mm -hmm. picture. Right, which for comedians is just making them laugh, and for realtors it's for just being that person that you know yeah. people trust and are loyal to. Um, and, and going back to what we were saying earlier, I, I like I've never really seen anybody, no matter what their intelligence level is, or what their background is, or what their privileges or not privileges or hardships were. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody consistently work hard and fail. Yeah, you know, and somebody mentioned that to me a number of years ago and said, you know, which I've never. Which one do you want, by the way? I'll take this one. Right, I've I heard I'll that one's crap, one. so you can have Thank that Thank you, one. appreciate that. <laughs> um, so the standing review before I open this is, we've heard it's crap. <laughs> she bought <laughs> it anyways. She's bought it anyways. Says knowing my husband. One well, of because I've seen you're over a pint, and I know that you've drank crap beers before. Oh, yeah. So Just some, oh, one, I actually drank it, turned, like, stopped the episode, went and got another beer, poured it out, and filled it up again. That bad? It was sea salt and coriander. Ew. It was terrible. Like Oh, was that you were talking about that in um, Tony Acavello's. Yeah, that was the one. Oh, that was that one. So yeah, so if you actually notice, like I start drinking it gets about here, and then there's a cut, and then you see my beer's filled. I actually because switched to a completely different beer. Yeah. I just and you guys were talking about coriander a little bit. Yeah, because I yeah. was because I was like because I looked at because he brought a full cooler of beer and I looked at him like Sea salt and coriander. That sounds interesting. I, you know, I'll give it a shot. Like, <laughs> I'll try. Like, I would never have. That sounds disgusting. Who who did that? Who? What, who? Um, it was a Hamilton Brewery, uh -huh. or Collective Arts, or Collective uh -huh. Brewing, or uh -huh. the ones with, like the really like cool. Yeah, like, yeah, the designs. Drawn. Yeah. So it was that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just like is ass the right word? But it it tasted quite terrible. Not that you would know what ass tastes like. No, but I have an assumption in my head, and it is sea salt and coriander now. <laughs> that does actually sound really gross, yeah, and mixed was. with hops on top of it. Yeah, it was not a no, good beer. Good. No. But then, like, like I've never had stouts before the show. Um, I'd never actually even, even had a Rattler before the show. Um, really? I, I like the Rattler. You live a sheltered life, dude. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, cheers to starting with a stout and finishing yeah. with a lager. We'll see if this is finishing. <laughs> you never know, we could go three beers deep. Oh, we do have questions from people, so before I forget... Oh, I know that Steve Saracen sent us a question. I like that guy. We got a bunch of questions, and even more since we started. Alright, so Steve, that's the first question, Steve Saracen. If you just got your license with the way the industry currently is, what would your first two years look like and what would your goals be? That's a really good question. Um, you know, the more that I learn, like I've spent so much time listening to um, success stories and listening to people that did it and listening to the people that are revered as being the best business coaches, not just in the real estate industry, but in any industry ever. And like the, the, the one thing that is repeated again and again and again is work your database. It's hard work, but it's free and it has your biggest potential for turnover. So if you're just getting your license and coming into this industry, the first thing that you need to work on is the people that you already know. So I worked my database. Not one person in my database moved in the first two years or my, my two years. Or so. But it's not about getting them to move. Like, oh, I was trying key. to get people who it's they the knew to. Oh, I was working on all that. Well, you must be an anomaly. Deal. You must be an anomaly. But then like a good friend of mine, it was funny. She in the first two years did not do a single deal that wasn't a direct right. uh, database thing. But it was just like, it was just timing wise. Cause I was also young. So none of my friends especially were anywhere close. Yeah. 
So it was literally just like I had to go after parents and friends of my parents. But you know, th there's there's downfalls and there's there's you know disappointments that come with any any effort at developing business. And I think yeah. when you work with the people that you know, or when you're trying to work the people that you know, one of the biggest problems that you're going to face is that letdown of having somebody that you thought was trusting you and loyal to you, um, not even telling you when they buy through somebody else. And yeah. you know, the I, the I remember the first time that I went through that, I'm, I'm kind of blessed, I guess, that I've got a really, really small family. Like my parents are in Oakville and my dad has a younger brother that lives out in Calgary and they have no kids. And my dad's parents were my only grandparents growing mm -hmm. up. And my mom's just, my mom was adopted and she's just found her biological family, but that was the extent of my family. So mm -hmm. I didn't have cousins that I was relying yeah. on to feed oh, me business, I right? <laughs> I find that a lot of people like expect their their close friends and their family to rely on them and they don't they take it really personally when they've yeah. got a friend or a family member that doesn't use them and everybody the, experiences that right I think the first time someone I knew didn't use me I felt hurt and then I like it was very quick turnaround and I credit him a lot for it is he's just like there's a men my mentor in my office I was like no that's your fault like you Whoa. screwed that up. If it did, like, if they didn't use you, you yeah. can't blame them. You only can blame yourself. Yeah. And I was like, or you don't have to blame yourself because, yeah. like, you know, there's a there's a lot of my friends that are really good at the industry that they work in, and I wouldn't hire them because it's too close. Yeah, you know, that's like, also what he said is he actually doesn't work with. Yeah. Like his family. Yeah. Or if he does, he doesn't give them a break either. Right. So like he charges them full commission. I, like I had a really good friend in Hamilton and she had a, a really nice house to sell in downtown Hamilton and she she like she I feel like she strung me along like she you know went went through the whole thing like I'm gonna sell can you tell me what my house is worth and yeah. I, I went through the whole thing and we had like a whole listing presentation we had a whole plan she was like yeah we're gonna do it this is really exciting yeah. you're gonna sell my house oh my god and I was really excited and then out of nowhere mm -hmm. I went to go look one morning just to see if anything had changed in her marketplace and I saw her house for sale yeah. with another a realtor and she didn't even tell me like as far as I'd known that morning I was going to be listing her house the week after she didn't even realtor. tell me yeah well I have two since yeah. then I have two so I was uh it's hard well that one was just more like luck but their neighbor three doors down was an agent and I was door knocking the street for like six months so my clients wanted to live on one street so once a month I went up and down the street door knocking, being like, thinking of selling, thinking of selling, thinking of selling, to the point that they're like, oh, hey again. <laughs> and then it just happened, this one house that had never answered, opens the door, she's like, we are actually thinking, we just bought a house in BC, so we need to sell. And I was like, great. Yeah. And I brought my client in, they loved the house, bought it, and yeah, so we ended up, but like we technically like put it on MLS, we put it on the market. For a day. Yeah, and it was like we brought them in because they wanted to have it up for that. And then we basically like the first second I signed the paperwork, I got my clients in the door. Yeah. And they made an offer that night. I think one showing from someone else got in. Yeah. Before we sold it officially because there was a little, a, quite a bit of back and forth. Yeah. But yeah, it was. But that happens, right? Yeah, like, and you know. And their agent actually called me to be like, you took my clients. And I was like. No, okay. I didn't. Congrats. But yeah, no, I didn't. I, I, didn't, good about I didn't actually take your clients at all. <laughs> yeah, I was okay um, but, but that's the thing is that everybody's going to experience that at least once in their life. Like we see that on the Facebook groups all the time. Like yeah. every, once a week, there's a post on hacks going, how do you feel when your sister buys a house through somebody else? And you're like, yeah, I mean, yeah. it sucks. Like get mad for a day. Would you charge, if you had a sister, because then you said you're an only child, right? But if you had a sister, would you charge them commission? Yes, but it would be reduced. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So actually, direct, direct family, like parents, sisters, I'd probably do it for free or listing their house at cost. Yeah. But... Like, I had an agreement with my parents. My parents have, like, a $2 million property in South Oakville. Mm -hmm. And they're, at one point, they were, obviously, they were going to sell. And um, we had agreed that they would pay me the full commission. Yeah. And then, just so that it would go towards my awards, it would go towards yeah. my GCI, my recorded, you know, whatever. And then I would kick it back, yeah. So if you want to sell now, I assume you're still licensed. Mm -hmm. Would you do it yourself or hire someone? Well, I just I just sold my condo and bought a house in Burlington in 2016 when I was still licensed. But you're still selling that. I was still selling that. So if I were to do it now, I wouldn't be allowed to do it now. We are non-competing brokers. I'm not allowed to take a, um, um, like our brokerage policy is that I can't take a commission check from my brokerage. So how would you, especially like having- So I would hire somebody. How would you go about that? Because that would be an interesting one of like, because I had this question a lot when we sold this. How did you choose an agent being so deep in the industry and knowing so many people? 
How would you do it, especially where you have how many people under you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually. How would you go about now if you had to sell your house, picking someone to do it? I, I, I think that I would go one of two ways and I probably would have to go through the experience of talking with them and strategizing with my husband before yeah. I made a choice. But what it would be one of two ways. And the first way would be, um, I would either look for somebody that was new where right. I could pretty much control the process yeah. from behind the so scenes, you're doing it. <laughs> um, or I would hire like the top realtor in my, in my branch and just say, but like, I'm yeah. just going with the top realtor yeah. just to you know, sort of, so I would either go with like the most inexperienced or the most experienced yeah. after interviewing both of them and having a conversation with my husband, yeah. probably. That's good. That's a tough question. Yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a tough spot to be put in. Yeah. Because you're like, how do you pick amongst all the... Because no matter what, someone's going to get upset that they don't have it. Yeah. Well, and I remember that in my branch. Like, I remember yeah. um, our old branch manager who was subsequently let go from the brokerage. Um, you know, he bought and sold a number of times while he was manager of mm -hmm. our branch. And he only ever hired um, one top producing team. But there was yeah. no... I don't think that there was really any opportunity for anybody else to compete for the business. He just yeah. sort of said... You know, I'm hiring this team and that was it. And it seemed yeah. very clandestine, which really put a yeah. lot of people's teeth on edge. So I think there's almost an argument you made if you're like the owner, that you, you should almost make the rule that they can't hire within the firm. Yeah, but then how do you give business outside of your own firm? Like it's, there's, you're always oh, no, going to no somebody off. But if it's like a standing policy. Isn't that a problem in our industry? That yeah. somebody is always going to be pissed off? Oh yeah, but that means you're doing something right. I guess. Yeah, yeah. people who don't like. Them. I mean, you know, listening to what Tony was talking about in his episode of Over a Pint, mm -hmm. just talking about the amount of haters that you get. Oh yeah, you know, all the time. The more vocal you are, and the more you accomplish, the greater yeah. your. Well, you remember haters. when you were more active in. Hell, people. I have more <laughs> haters today than I did three yeah. years ago when I was really aggressive on social yeah. media, and I'm still pretty aggressive. Because that was also it was funny. My first impression of you, I was like, oh, she seems like a bitch. Every <laughs> 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 like, time I saw you online, you're just. Ripping people. <laughs> And I was just like, who is this woman? I know, I know. And for, full disclosure, I am a bitch. Like, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I well, am a bitch. And I'm totally okay with that's that. That's in a good way, to be fair. But at the time, just because it was only Facebook groups, that's all I saw. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember when that was now. Or because I now. only ever chime in when somebody is saying something ridiculously stupid on a Facebook yeah. group. And those are the ones where I always typed in the answer, but then deleted it and walked right. away. You hit enter. Yeah. And I kind of admired I didn't give a shit. Yeah. There was <laughs> a little bit of admiration there of like, <laughs> That, that and now I still do. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I've, I've, I've been in a couple of, of, you know, quite, you know, concerning and serious yeah. altercations over the last year or so since yeah. I've even taken this leadership role. Um, but most of them have served me well because yeah. I will never, ever pipe up unless I am confident in what I am saying to be true. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that I'm never wrong. I mean, everybody's wrong yeah. sometimes. And I think as long as you're able to admit that, then you're in a better place than you could be if you were like yeah. a full on bitch. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I have more of a working knowledge of this industry than the vast majority of people. But the, like, like 801, for example, yeah. like I, it's gotten to the point in my reputation yeah. where now people tag me when there's an 801 post because they know how much it drives me crazy. Yeah. Um, and really, and that, and that really lends itself to why I do what I do and why I'm a non-selling managing broker now, because my, my daily job is to make sure that people are following best practices, yeah. being the best they can be, not breaking the law, not violating, you know, Reba 2002, um, and being the best people that they can be because Lord only knows we have the worst reputation as realtors in so, North yeah. America. So it's interesting. So that's what a lot of people seem to think. And I remember when I was so I did like a seminar and I made a comment about that to a couple of people about like how agents have, and this was like a room of consumers and like that topic kind of came up and I'd say 90% of the room did not have it. They're all like, what are you talking about? Like agents are awesome. They're so involved in the community. Like it was a really weird switch. I felt like, yeah, there's always that subset of people, but I think it, it, it's almost just as much in agents' head because there's like a few, like a really vocal minority. I have a, I have a, I have a definition of that. Mm -hmm. If you ask a random consumer, like mm -hmm. if you take like a, you know, like a focus group of random consumers and you say, what do you think of the real estate industry? What do you think yeah. of realtors? And they will say, you know, they're, they're money hungry, they're swindlers, they're dishonest, yeah. they're, you know, only out for a paycheck. And then you say to a, an average consumer, mm -hmm. what do you feel mm -hmm. about your realtor? Yeah. So like, don't look at the industry as a whole, look at your specific realtor that you've worked with in the past and they'll be like, they go to bat for me. They'd lay down in front yeah. of a truck for me. They are the most honest the person in the world. Among the yeah. Friends. And you're right. There are more hardworking, honest, 
ethical, knowledgeable, experienced realtors out there than there are dishonest ones. But we all know that in any industry, oh, yeah. you know, one everyone, Apple there's can... There's bad at lawyers, there's bad doctors. Totally. Not that I like the comparison of real estate agents to lawyers and doctors, I hate that one. Right. Um, but that's saying like every industry has shitty people. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But so you, you look at the industry as a whole and you're like, eh, you have to be careful about who you choose. And then yeah. when you find one, you're like, that's the best person ever. Yeah. And we definitely have more high quality realtors or people that at least want to work hard mm -hmm. and do well by their clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you know, the problem is, is that there isn't a lot of money to be had in real estate and we, we there's so many people that are coming into the industry and it, we're so oversaturated in GTA. Oh yeah, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's Everybody's desperate for a paycheck. Yeah. In my first like three weeks as an agent, I was at an office meeting and someone made the joke, if you want to get rich in real estate, you have to sell to real estate agents. Yes. And find something made, to sell to realtors. I say that too. It made me laugh and now that's what I do. Yes. <laughs> right? And how much yeah. more successful and happy are you by Oh, I'm making way more than I did when I sold. Exactly. And it's not close. No. Like, it is a significant difference. Yes. <laughs> yes. To the point that now I get paid to sit here and drink on a Friday morning. Cheers to that. Yeah. It's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Although if I went back and sold, I would just do this with local people. <laughs> but with business owners and shop yeah. owners. Well, literally, like the, uh, the next episode I'm filming today is a local guy. So Steve Saracen, there's your answer. Yeah. Get 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 drunk. And, you know, and he works <laughs> in a market that's like a you know like I, I, so. look at people like like Steve Saracen and I look at people like um, like Andrew Perry for example, another yeah. one where they work in a smaller market, but it's still a busy enough with a high enough turnover that they've got mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity there. But what they're what we're finding is that they're they their competition while they may dominate the market. It, um, have not dominated the market in terms of you know certain millennial style um, marketing aspects and yeah. internet exposure. Um, like if you were to to Google search anybody down in Niagara in the Lake. Um, you would not find a strong internet presence for anybody that focuses on vineyards and Let's all that. Kind of, let's do that. So are we searching? Niagara Lake Farms. Niagara Lake, Lake Farms. Niagara Lake Farms. For we'll sale. see who shows up. For sale. And if it's not you, Andrew, we're yeah. going to crap. Then you're going to have to Niagara hire Andrew. Niagara Lake <laughs> Farms for sale. And I spelled farms wrong, but autocorrect is going to fix it for me. All right. Ooh, paid ads come up. Sotheby's is number one. Let's see the first free one. Ooh, point to homes, point to homes. All right, Remax. Perry, CA, Perry you've got page. some work to do. Yeah, no, so far, no agents. Oh, notlrealty.com is the first agent, that, and that's more brokerage. Mm -hmm. So on the first page, there's not a okay. single individual agent. Okay, but let's talk about this a little bit. When, we, when we're talking about, about people that are like 35 and under, Yeah. and are they just going to Google and typing Niagara Farms for sale, is that what they're typing? Or are they gonna be more um, passively understanding who dominates the market via their social media channels like Instagram and Facebook? So when I think... And hold that thought because I actually... So um, Jason Steele asked if people confuse me with the Costco brand. Probably. And um, I actually, I mean, no, I don't get confused with the co Really? Are you sure? That seems like such an <laughs> obvious one to happen that, <laughs> but, wait, you're not the one behind <laughs> yes, Kirkland brand it's, soda? It's a real confusion. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have thought that that would be the number one struggle in your career, that people were like, you're the Harris or the founder of Costco's Kirkland brand products. Jason, we love you. But, but no. come on. No, best. But no, best. but no, um, <laughs> no. Well, usually when I, when people ask me what my last name is and I say that it's, uh, it's Kirkland and then they go, they, like they pause for a minute as if they're trying to figure out how to spell that in their brain and really? I'll say it like the Wait, I get that. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. But you how do you would. not know Kirkland? It's very, it's Kirkland, like it's easy. Don't you get people that ask you to confirm how to spell your first name? Andrew? No. Really? Literally it's I get like, people that ask me how to spell Sandra. It's like the most popular name in the world. Okay. Outside of like Muhammad Muhammad. <laughs> and then it's like Andrew. Um, well, I had um, I had a very unique last name before I got married, and then I went to a really common last name once I got married. But I still get people to ask me um, how to spell it. And then when I say like the Costco brand, and they go, "Oh, any relation?" Ha ha ha. And I go, "If no. if there was, I wouldn't be here. I'd yeah. be on my own private island outside of Hawaii." Like I mean. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, yeah, the discount branding really hasn't worked out for you then. No. But my claim to fame in, in changing my name from a unique last name to... Which uh, was? Uh, Gilrain. 
Very Irish, G I O. I would say you are Irish. Yeah, yeah so it was guilty. <laughs> it wasn't just the fun I went there. No, and <laughs> I'm, we're actually able to determine that everybody with the last name of Gilrain in the world is somehow related to me. Yeah, it's me with fully out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's not a lot. They, no. no, some are pretty. There's actually, we did find out there is another group of fully in Canada, in BC. Everyone with our name Same. in Ontario is us. Same. Yeah. We, we actually come from Manitoba, but the vast majority of my last name um, immigrated out to BC, yeah. and now most of them are in Vancouver or yeah. in England. I forget where they are, but there's a restaurant somewhere. <laughs> I don't know if it's still there, because I haven't looked in years, but at one point there was a restaurant somewhere in BC called Foliato. Really? Yeah. And there's also a wine That's from cool. Italy called Foliato that I actually tried to get imported and it didn't happen. So that means um, you have to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. All right, fine. There's a wine that I've been trying to try out in Arizona from my, my, my favorite rock star in the entire yeah. world. He owns a vineyard in Arizona and I've been yeah. trying to get that shipped here and I can't, so I'm going to have to go so, down and buy yeah, some. Might as well. Yeah. So we have another question from Jennifer Patterson. Oh, hi, Jen. How She's did you girl. get so awesome? Aww. Tips? Tricks? So Jen, if you just wipe that little piece of brown there, like Aww. right off. I love that chick. We'll She's Jen, awesome. We'll get Sandra to answer that now. Jen's awesome. I yeah. love her. And then... Do you, oh, you already did the. You can thank my mom good. and dad for being so awesome, by the way. So there you go. Future episode the Kirkland brand parents that are actually the Gilrain. So here's a really cool tidbit about my new last name, though, being Kirkland, is that my husband, his name is Kirk. Kirk Kirkland? Yes. So I've actually heard, it's not the first person I heard, like there was a guy growing up that was Fergus Ferguson. <laughs> oh, that's bad. Sorry, he was Fergus Ferguson Jr. No, that's bad. Fergus Ferguson is bad. Um, oh. But there's the famous realtor in uh, Toronto named Will Wilkinson, and we love Will. Yeah, you know, actually, my Will's favorite amazing. agent last name is, and it's not in that frame of Kirk Kirkland. His last name is Moist. Oh, <laughs> no. That's my favorite. No, that's my bad. It's Kevin Moist from Winnipeg. That's if you get bad. tagged in this. Moist. Yeah. That's bad. Moist is just a great word. It, okay. No, it's really, it's okay. terrible. I'm sorry, Kevin. There, there are some uh, really great names in this industry, though. That's like, true. there's, like, I mean, of course, there's, like, the price, you know, and yeah, Jill will just, say that she married yeah. in order to get that name, which is brilliant. There's Sandy Sold, who we see I, on, on Hacks all the time. Do you know my favorite one? Because every now and then there's, like, those photos of people. So there was someone with the first name Dorita, and her headshot, she's holding a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah, I was like, way to um, lean into it. <laughs> a friend of mine's husband works in the HVAC industry and he worked with somebody, I think she did admin of their office or whatever, and her name was, um, oh shoot, her name was Corona. Her first name was Corona. Yeah. And she married a guy whose last name was By a Case. That's good. So her name is actually Corona By a Case. I love I that. Like so I like they that. should just hire her. Yes. She goes around. And like stuff. seriously, my yeah. name is Corona. Corona By a Case. See, like, that my, my last name never works for that. That's awesome. It does nothing. No. Although interesting, so foliato. If you take out the lot, like the T O, folia means paper. And because apparently back in the day, according to this guy who knows this stuff. It means that in Italy, we were the intellectuals in the town who like could actually read and write. So you'd come to our family to do like your letters. So you're a real smarty pants. Yeah. That's what you're saying. But what's funny is like folia, it also is like foliage. And I've had a lot of like um, cold callers and telemarketers who were who like, people like, hi, can I speak to Mr. Foliage? <laughs> like, did you just translate that or are you an idiot? <laughs> so <laughs> foliage. There you go. Fun. Yeah, no, like, I don't think I've, only, actually, the only presentation, there's two places in the world where I've done a presentation where they've got my name right. One, obviously. You got your name right. Yeah, but I, I had to tell right. you. I had to, you know me though, right? Like, well, okay, all right. Like, perfect. without me saying anything, without going into it, two Maybe. places. One, the obvious, Woodbridge. I mean, it's just natural there. The other, Windsor. Does Windsor have a high population of Italians? Huge. Oh, yeah. okay. So, Windsor, they got my name right without prompting. Although when I went to Italy when I was young, that was the coolest feeling ever when I could, they'd like, what's your name? And I would say it and they would just spell it without asking. Mm. Because they know the GLI thing and I'm like. You feel like you're among your people. Oh yeah, that was yeah. amazing. Like to, to remember the first time I said my name to a complete stranger and they got it perfect. I'm like, that happens? Yeah. This is a thing? Yeah, I got that with Gilrain yeah. when I moved to Ireland when I was yeah. 19. They That's just nice. knew. Yeah. G-I-L-R-A-I-N-E. Yeah, but you knew me before I got married, didn't no. you? No, you did. That's right, you didn't. I didn't. Mm. No. When did you get married? 
uh, 20, ooh, my anniversary is next week. 20, my anniversary is my Wi-Fi password, so. 14, four, 2014. Ooh, I got married before you. 2014. So, what, we did we know each other? Maybe I don't not. know. I don't think so. So yeah, I'm just good with spelling apparently. At well, where, how did we meet? Let's let's delve into this. It was through was it through the Aria Emerge conferences when I was with Repri? Probably. No, I'm pretty sure. I feel like I knew you like before Facebook that. Facebook groups. Because like when I was so like when I was an agent, I wasn't that active in them. Plus, they weren't really big then. But then when I joined Integra as a trainer, I was like. As much as they don't talk about it, training department is not a training department. It's a recruitment and retention department. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it was I would go and just friend everybody we could in the industry. So I'm guessing we got connected because I was a trainer, and then part of that would be influencing people who are not. No, I'm not sure I was on your radar then. You would have been a friend of mine on Facebook, though, I think. Maybe. But I also then, don't randomly add people on Facebook the way so many people do. Apparently you did. I think we became uh, friends. We can no, no, friends is a different thing, though. <laughs> like, there's the radar, then there's this next piece of friends. Because remember, at the beginning, I just knew you as that bitch from Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then... So maybe it was Repri that turned into the friendship. Because I was, at the time, No, because for we've tech. only been friends since December 2015. that's my new account. Because I had an account with Integra... And then when I was like, Whoa. I don't think I was friends with your old account because like, I remember this being like the first picture we ever took together. Yeah. But you were excited to finally meet in person and take that photo. Because we'd spent a couple of months together working in this. And zone. had known each other for a while. I'm but pretty sure. You were just sell homes then. Yes. But again, I didn't start like you that. Need, account you need to superimpose this picture over this chat right now. If this yeah. is going to go live because this is a picture of me and Andrew and I'm well, forgetting his name, name and I feel bad. Yes. Yes. Because he was with the company that got bought. He was, he I ran Full Tour. He yes. was CEO of Full Tour. Yes, right. Yeah. And I forget the name. Yeah. And this was Wasega Beach. Yes, it was. Because we spoke there and that was back, yeah, when I consulted for you were Cap. You were just about to have Hannah at that point. Yes. What was the date on the photo? December, uh, uh, I don't know. May 18th, 2016. She didn't come till November. So she, we were So like, you were pregnant. pregnant. Yeah. And I think that's where I found yeah, it. Yeah, we were pregnant. Valentine's Day-ish pregnant. That, see, it seems like a lot longer than that, though. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, a lot it's happened. It's only been like two and a half You were still years. selling then. You were I the was. face of Repri with Kelly. I was. Yeah. Yeah, that was good And times. I was the face of Deal Tap. Oh, God. That's why you were there was Deal Tap. Yeah, I was pitching now. Tap. And pro Deal Tap. I feel like I won the pitch there because I had more people coming to talk to me. Yeah, you did. And I was, I was, that was, that was hard to swallow. Yeah, but to be fair though, the deal tap pitch they were is a better of pitch. It was just, well, they, like, the, 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 the idea crap. of the platform was better than anything else in the market if they could have executed on it. They just didn't. No. Still haven't. Yeah. They're working on it from what I hear. I haven't heard hide nor hair out of them in ages. And there was, so, a, there was a digital signature conversation, I think, on Toronto Real Estate 2.0. Oh, they're not even like... Where like one they're... person said, I use Deal Tap, And I was like, what? Yeah, they're, they're in the professional... Why? I think they're in the eighth version of beta testing now. So do they have those same two booths at Realtor Quest this year? I wonder. I have... You know, long do I stop there? It was hurting my brand. I know. Just the fact Maybe I was associated your with purple shirts. two straight failed launches. I had to get away because people were like, you're the Deal Tap guy. I'm like, I can't be known as that. No. I was the Evernote guy. Then I became the Deal Tap guy. Then now uh, Facebook ads, I guess. So maybe that's how I came across you was because of Evernote, I think. Because I think you that talking about Evernote, nice Evernote might have led me down the paperless agent path. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You have to. And that's what I was saying in your post in the wheelhouse the other day where no. you were saying, apart from uh, repeat business and referrals, where mm -hmm. would you generate the most leads? And, and my answer to that was open houses. Mm -hmm. um, and if I could turn back time and go back to selling, then I would probably do an open house every Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. I would spend $200 on social media advertising, make sure, making sure that everybody that had recently been in the area knew about my open house. Mm -hmm. And I would provide some kind of epic item of value at the open house that would pe keep people... Okay, what would be an epic item of value? Yeah, that was a question to my to my response in that post, and I was thinking about that actually on the way here, and thinking, what would 
would that be? Maybe that would be some kind of buyer package. Um, like what would it cost to buy a house in that price range um, with a certain amount of down payment? What are you paying in P&I? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you have to watch for in terms of the yeah. neighborhood? What are the good schools? Like I would do probably a whole community package um, based on that one property. So I heard an interesting one as a uh, Ralph Chancio <coughs> from Sells and Markham. So I'm going to try and get him on the show. Um, he's actually at my mastermind on Tuesday. Um, I was at a different mastermind with him and I believe he gives out a $5 gas card saying, thanks for spending the time to drive here. Allow me to reimburse you for your gas cost to come. He says that like that five dollar gas card to everyone who attends has like an exponential ROI for them. Yeah, and my my company yeah. used to do branded gas cards. Hmm. I don't know if he brands them. I'd have to, we'll find out when I've ever I end up having Ralph on this show. And we don't do them anymore because they weren't profitable. Nobody bought them. So maybe you need to listen to the future episode with Ralph. He doesn't know he's on yet. <laughs> That's how we're gonna pitch him to come on the show, Ralph. So so that some means. kind of item of value to make sure that you stand out because you have to think that, and I always said to myself, and this may be why open houses were such a big conversion for me, that I always said that people that were coming to an open house weren't necessarily shopping for a house, they were shopping for a realtor and they just didn't really realize it. Yeah. it you probably did better because you knew the year the furnace was built. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, but know your inventory. <laughs> knowing the people that are walking into a house are shopping for a realtor and not really a house because they're just sort of going to open houses wow. almost aimlessly. Um, once you start having a conversation with people, um, you're able to have a better opportunity to convert them in terms of the value of working with a buyer realtor. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, going back to Steve Saracen's question and the question that was asked of me in the wheelhouse and going, you know, what is that item of value? Well, if 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 people are out doing open houses because they don't have representation and they don't really know what they're doing. Um, one of the things that really worked well for me at open houses was to actually book a preview for a comparable property that wasn't open that day mm -hmm. and I would book it at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And anybody that walked into my open house I would say I'm actually going to preview this other property that's comparable that wasn't yeah. open today. You can't go to it now even if you wanted yeah. to. I'm going there at 4.30. Do you want to join me? And if they say, yeah, totally, I'll be like, great, let's exchange contact information. Yeah. And then if they did show up, then I would call, you know, to make sure that the seller knew that I was doing a showing instead of a preview. Yeah. And if, if they didn't show up, then I would still doing, I was still doing a preview. So I was still getting the market knowledge so I that was needed. Probably 40, 50 open houses when I sold one deal and it was not the open house, but it was actually pretty funny. So as I'm leaving, a couple came through and they're like, this house is really not, I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in hiring an agent, yada, yada, yada. And I'm leaving the open house, I start driving and like two blocks away, I see that family standing in front of a for sale sign looking like confused because there's no open house there. So I just pull over and I'd be like, do you guys want to like see this house? Like what's, they're like, yeah, but we like, we're trying to call the agent. We can't get a hold of them. Like we can't get into the house, but we're here. That's kismet. So I pick up the phone, call the brokerage and I'd be like, I'd like to book a showing on this house. Right Can we do it for right now? It was vacant. So they just flipped me the lockbox code. So I let them in. They're like, but you know, this like means that like, we only like to work with the listing agent. Like we were telling you over there. We don't want to work with the buyer agent. I'm like, that's fine. Glad I was able like, to open I'm the door here. For you. Like I'll yeah. open it for you and we'll chat. And the, w the husband still didn't want it. The wife called me later and was just like, we actually really liked that you did that uh, even when we told you you wouldn't get our business. So let's start looking. I mean, later they screwed me, which is a whole other thing. So what's, but... what's, what's the takeaway from that, right? Like for everybody that's watching, who is not just watching two idiots drinking beer all day, just like the take people. The, <laughs> the takeaway from that is help to think with people's hearts and not their wallets. And that's a common saying in the industry, right? Yeah. I just figure if I help enough people with whatever's going on. So like now as part of my, like I did this when I was selling too, and I even do it because now like, I like to be that person who people go to, to get an introduction to someone else. Yeah. Even if I have nothing to stand for it. Because like, and that's part of the reason I do a lot of networking too, is, and I also just enjoy it. Um, but like to be like that hub of like, and I get it a lot now, like, no, especially the past, like since the show, the show's been like a big driver of that now. Cause like someone's on the show and being like, oh, can you introduce me to him or can her or whatever? Yeah. And that's been a, like, that for me is like an intentional effort to get to yeah. that point. Um, and then introducing, but then also controlling those introductions too. Cause like if someone comes to ask for an introduction and you can, 
you get that feeling that it's not one that the person would appreciate, you don't do it. <laughs> right. Uh, so don't just introduce anyone. So it's sure. that idea. Yeah. Of, no, you have to, because you, be your reputation is still at stake when you yeah. make these introductions. Yeah, I'm yeah. putting myself on the line for them a bit. And, and I, I, that's sort of what has led me to be less of a bitch on the internet. Because mm. I am more concerned about how people perceive me than I, yeah. I previously was because yeah. of my network and because of my stature and because of my identity yeah. as a as a thought influencer in this industry, yeah. um, you know. And I want to I, I want to make sure that people know that I am somebody that that makes sure that I'm knowledgeable and experienced mm. in what it is that I'm talking about and that I know a lot mm. about this industry and I can help and I want to help. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm also okay with people knowing that like. If you misuse 801, I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to tear like, you a new one. You're, just <laughs> you're gonna, annoying the crap out of me. <laughs> you're done. Cut if you're going to ask me brand. to give you a form 801 to register my yeah. offer, I'm probably going to punch you in the face is, yeah. is how it's going to work. <laughs> Throw a beer in your I'm not wasting beer. On <laughs> no, don't waste a beer yeah. on form 801. That's oh, ridiculous. Yeah. I, so form 801 came in after I stopped selling, I think. So I never that was like a 2015 it. thing with Bill 55. Yeah, so it would have been while I was training, I think. Because I think I stopped training. Well, no, so I'll be, so it's 2019. This August will be, or this July will be four years with Just Sell Homes. So yeah, 2015. Wow. Yeah. It seems like not, it seems like both too short and too long of a time. Like it seems like way more than four years, but it also doesn't seem like four years. Yeah. That's good. Well, to be fair though, my promotion strategy was basically the same as when I was a trainer, just help as many people as I can. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit because I'm dying to know um, what is the next, what do the next five years hold for you? Personally, like not necessarily just, just sell homes, but what does the next five um, years look like for Andrew Foliato? So we're making a push into the US, so I expect probably more travel because um, we're doing a lot more in the US now. Um, and I'm also trying to kind of separate just sell homes from Andrew Foliato. Oh. Because the first few years, everyone was hiring me, not the company. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is then I have to take every call. every Everything has to be done through me, and that becomes a bottleneck in your growth. Um, but you were so much a part of your brand in that company yeah, that it's hard to it's, separate that. It is, but that's where I'm like, you'll see, like, I promote. When like an email question comes up, I promote our copywriter as like, she knows what she's doing, talk to her. And like, I make that point of like showing the team as experts too, so that you're comfortable talking to them. Like that's an intentional thing. Um, so like we're trying to separate them a bit. So like I've, I haven't really done anything with it, but like I've started an Andrew Foliato business page to eventually be able to like separate it from just sell homes. Um, so like that's all like part of the intention of kind of separating everything and like I want to eventually like, do more and more paid speaking like I get paid now for everything but I want to get like 5 to 10k a talk and now I'm at like 25 3500 a talk I've gotten like 1 5k it's excellent um, yeah I'm not gonna complain it's no, just good money to go to talk for an hour yeah or two. um but yeah like, we're intentionally trying to separate them but like eventually I want to stop taking a salary from just sell homes and only get like my money becomes the speaking um, and then I can put all that money back into the company. Um, but we're going to make a bunch of changes in terms of like our offering. Like eventually like we're building and hopefully like the first beta is going to launch in the next month, um, of like a higher end package mm -hmm. that starts at 2,500 a month. Um, and eventually that'll be the only thing we offer. And then we'll have elite. So like we'll have the membership group and then the platinum high end. Cause like ideally for me, I'd rather less clients that I can like really dive deep into and have fun with. Um, and the, the other switch we're gonna be making, right now, like up until now, the company's been kind of like, we focus on agents for the agency side who already make a couple hundred thousand a year. And mm -hmm. up. Now we want agents who make a couple hundred thousand and up who produce content. Right. Because if you produce content, I can have a lot more fun and I can get a lot more creative with how we're marketing you. Um, and I just enjoy that more, whereas opposed to like, Here's another direct response ad. <laughs> An out of the box, you know, yeah, yeah so, stenciled. Yeah, eventually we're going to move away and do like all custom, only custom, full end to end type of thing. Like literally like the just sell homes idea. Like you just sell homes, let us deal with everything else. That's cool. So that's five feet. It'll take time to get there. So um, do you think that you're going to be um, running just sell homes or in the industry for the duration of your career? Like you probably don't have that plan because like everything is for sale and things can turn on a dime tomorrow, but 
Is that sort of what you're thinking? In my head, I, it's a debate I have from the sense, like I love the industry, so like that end of it, I want to stay in it. But then there's also a limit on the agent side of what that max fee per month is, right? Like I, an agent's not gonna be paying me 10K plus ad spend to market their business. Or maybe there's like three who will do it. Right. That's not a business. Right. But through my market, like my networking with a lot of other marketers who through mar networking with them, people charging 10 to 20K a month per client, they're not any better at what they do than I do. So there's part of me that's like, what if I kind of change but that I don't know that I would want to do that. But um, in some capacity, you're going to stay in the similar, in, in the same probably. vein. Probably. I mean, you never know. So what happens when Facebook dies? Because we all know Facebook is going to die. Like there's okay. people that are um, under 25 that are just never even opening Facebook accounts because it's the old person's social media. Everything we do works on any platform. It just works the best on Facebook right now. I hate Facebook around election season. That's oh, where I delete them. Award seasons. I don't mind that because I don't know, like, yes, I find it annoying. Like. Cause like some brokerages, like literally one brokerage has a zero to 50,000 award <laughs> and that pisses the hell out of me. Like literally you show up, you get an award. Um, there's actually a great Jerry Seinfeld thing where he makes fun of it. Um, I but I don't know, like, if you bust your ass and you make a quarter million a year, celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I I'm fine with that. I agree. Like you should celebrate it. I agree. Um, there's no awards in the industry, so whatever, um, <laughs> for me, but. I I have no problem with people celebrating. Like, there's a difference between like celebrate an achievement versus I'm just gonna brag about how rich I am. Like, there's different levels of that. But I'm fine with celebrating award season to a degree. I mean, if like in my first year though, it also depends on the award. So like my first year, I won. I was with Remax, so I was executive club. So in year one, so like no deals in the first six months. The second six months, I made 68 grand. So they gave me an award for it. But I was on a 60-40 split for my first 50,000, then 90-10, yeah. plus 300 you something a month. You were poor as shit. That yeah, year. like literally, like, yeah. when I did the numbers and then looked at what the poverty line in Canada was, I was like right Well, the there. vast majority of realtors are under the poverty line year over and year. That's people what pissed that. me off is they like, how many people do you, so like literally someone said to me like, well, how many people do you know at your age make 68 grand a year? I'm like, I didn't make 68 grand. I'm lucky you to take made almost as much as I did yeah. off what I made. Yeah. Um, so like that type of award, bullshit. Um, but like when you're up there and you're making, because like at a quarter million, unless you just completely blow your expenses on stuff, like you're taking home a good salary. Yes. Um, well, I, 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 most of the calculations and the numbers will suggest that you take home 35 to 40% of what your GCI is, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at other people who are broadcasting that they're making um, I, I, whatever awards levels, like President's Gold, for example, in Royal LePage, which is the top six to 10% yeah. of Royal LePage realtors across the country, 19,000 realtors, whatever. Um, really what that means is depending on where they are, because that's a broad stretch too. Like last year that was 135,000 to 265,000. So I is think it based on gross commission or number of deals? GCI. Well, we have both. We do both. Yeah, because that was always one, like when I worked at Remax, that it kind of, like, I didn't know how yeah, to Yeah, like if you work in like, Oakville where the average house price is 1.2 yeah, versus working in Windsor. Or sell 50 and make the same amount depending yeah. on your market. But if you make 50 in Oakville, then you're nowhere, like, you're so far ahead. Right. And, like, that was always like, what's that right balance there? Uh, and really it's just both and I love there. that yeah I love that because you're right because somebody could sell 70 homes in Windsor yeah. and not make near as much GCI as you would if you sold seven homes in Oakville yeah. like if you literally if you only worked like the five million plus market sold two homes you made a living yeah or the commercial industry yeah you where you do one, one deal every years. three years yeah. and it's it takes like two years to do a seven hundred thousand dollar deal yeah. like we've got somebody in our office that did 17 transactions on a new build in mississauga yeah. they bought 17 ends or they had people that bought 17 ends in the avio project in mississauga mm -hmm. and like he's going to make over four hundred thousand dollars but that doesn't close until 2021 yeah so you gotta live 2023 even yeah yeah so do resale <laughs> yeah, yeah, or rentals. Little yeah. close next well, month. Rentals. So my first, my first deal ever was a seven hundred and fifty a month basement <gasps> apartment, and I got half of it. Uh, and then a sixty forty so, split with your brokerage. Yeah, uh, but the best part of this, and I'm actually to this day proud of my negotiated abilities on it, even though I probably shouldn't be. I got him in there. His monthly 
like income gross was lower than the rent and he's like getting what? in there and i was able to talk them into letting him in and then what happened three months later he got evicted <sighs> So, and yeah, I shouldn't be proud of it, but I'm proud that I was able to Negotiate test my negotiating that. ability to yeah, yeah. point that yeah. literally gross, didn't yeah. even make enough to pay rent and they went for him. So I've got a big claim to fame too. Like in the 11 years that I sold real estate, yeah. my clients never had to move more than the other client did. Never. Like in the entire history that I sold, that was my big claim to fame. My clients moved less in negotiation than the other clients would. Yeah, but if you just overbid, then of course they wouldn't move more. Shh. So, Shh. You could go either way with that. <laughs> no, but it, would, it, was, it was always good negotiation. Yeah. Give me that. Says the person behind it who has to represent their clients. No, it's true though, but it's true. Well, I believe you, I'm just saying, there's a Stick lot of holes in that potential. Sure, so, sure. Some, some instances weren't as great as others, but yeah. over the 11 years that I sold, my clients always moved less than the other clients did. So when are you doing a course on negotiation? Well, uh, I actually, I was gonna go work for Sue's coming and do the C&E courses. Oh, yeah, sure. She asked me if I, would, yeah. if I would teach her courses. Do you still get a lot of offers? Cause like I found that the, the people who are really active on Facebook get a ton of job offers in the industry. I do. Yeah, I My do. My first two years of just sell homes, I got like one to two a month from different companies. Yeah. Less now, because I think they've kind of figured out I'm not going anywhere. But. Yeah. I get a lot of requests for speaking engagements. Yeah. Um, I just did, yesterday I just did um, uh, a Royal LePage Canada webinar on digital signatures that was broadcast to over a thousand people. You still involved with Ripley? No. Done? Well, yeah, because my past oh, boss, sold Brent, to sold to Next One. True. And I quit yeah. about two weeks after. Makes sense. Yeah, after so who do you use then? Um, I I use AuthentiSign because it's free. Fair. Yeah, I I I probably wouldn't if I had a choice. Mm -hmm. If I could if I could justify the expenditure, I would, you would still use deal free. No, I would, <laughs> fuck no, <laughs> Jesus Christ, no, um, no, uh, I would I would use Repre. Yeah. I really love that platform. Well, oh. did it die? No. Nope, but it's about to. So I'm going to go get. Another battery. We're almost done. Yeah. We got like 15 more minutes and it might be gold. Yeah. That sounds like another beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to stick around for lunch? Do you uh, skip the dishes? Yes. Wings? Do you like wings? I love wings. Let, let's do wings because then I can stay keto. All right. Deal. They're normally breaded. Well, no, you get dusted. Oh, wow, wing. They do dusted. Sure. Single this is wings. a great part of the episode. <laughs> Watch us as we order lunch. <laughs> we have a bunch of things that you yeah. can use as your intro now. Um, Do you want another beer? Uh, now that we're ordering food, yes. 32 minutes until our food is here. All right. That sounds like a beer in a future episode content. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of content for your opening laugh before the credits it's roll. true. Yeah, we do. We made it to add in like an extra bonus section <laughs> at the end of this episode. So before we go back on camera, um, what you know, was- recording right now. Sure, I mean, you're, you're able to edit it out, it's not like we're live. <laughs> so back on the record. Yep. <laughs> Censored. This one will be edited by me, not my gun. <laughs> <laughs> or me, you definitely yeah. really don't want me to edit it. Yeah, or it's no. just gonna be like a repeat of your burp over and over again. Did you notice the burps during the episode? <laughs> I was trying not to watch. <laughs> but did you notice? No. I hid them well. No. <laughs> did you notice well, mine? No, because you don't burp. Uh, well, true, but I did have a couple of moments where I was like... So you burp. So you lied. This now we're back online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great opener right there. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's the third beer talking. <laughs> I'm crying. Uh, um, classic. Classic <laughs> JSH moment. I'm crying. <laughs> Is that what you do to make girls cry? Every day. <sighs> oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that's why you do it over a pint because and that, not why. Like, <laughs> not <laughs> <why>. <laughs> that's so true. I'm wildly inappropriate. It should not go on air. The um, edit button's my friend. Uh, 
Oh my goodness, that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. So we were we were gonna like drop like you know really pertinent anecdotes for people to be able to learn from us though. Don't go live if you have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> or Tip if you're one. drinking. So my brother and I is amazing. So we have a bet on first one to get under 200 pounds. Okay. But the kicker is, if you think about a weight loss bet, a lot of them what happens is like someone just gives up and the other guy wins. So the our favorite restaurant downtown was Jacobs. We're like the steaks start at like 75 a steak. Like it's expensive, but it's worth it. Like every, like we got there one time and every piece of food I had was the best version of that food I'd ever had in my life. It was amazing. So originally I was like, what if we just bet 500 bucks for the first person to get under 200 pounds? He goes, better, dinner at Jacob's. Oh. But then we were like, what if one of us gives up and is like, fuck it, I'll pay the 500. So we instituted the skunk rule. So the skunk rule is if the person gets under 200 pounds and the other person is still over 220, the winner gets oh. to bring a guest oh. to dinner. The loser has to pay for that guest, sit at the table and not eat. Oh! So they have to watch the other two have this super expensive dinner. That they pay for. That they pay for it and they have to sit there and can only have water. That's an excellent fail safe. <laughs> and we will now give. <laughs> Oh, you say Jeff, not Geth? It is Jeff. Dictionary.com announced it. Dictionary.com isn't the creator of pronunciation. But if I'm going to trust a source on anything related to <laughs> pronunciation and words... It shouldn't be an internet source. Andrew, come on. Dictionary.com. Sure. I'm going with what they say, but which they is also, it. no, but they actually went back to the source of the inventor of the GIF and figured out that it was originally meant to be GIF. So dictionary.com on Twitter confirmed it because then Jiffy, the company, responded saying, we disagree because obviously they think it's Giffy. Okay. The Oxford English Dictionary oh, accepts oh, both pronunciations. But it's meant. Will Height told the New York Times they are wrong. It's a soft G pronounced GIF. Mm -hmm. The G in GIF stands for graphic. I don't care. Which is pronounced with a hard G. It's graphic interchange format, not giraffic interchange format. Okay. So you but would it was say intended G -I -F, as. But you would say GIF. No, it's GIF. No, graphic. GIF. No, GIF. Doesn't matter. It's a hard G. Doesn't matter. Yes, it's it now does. its own. No, word. it fucking matters. No, it doesn't. And it doesn't matter because I'm right, it's GIF. Well, I say GIF, and that's well, right. Well, look up the inventor of the GIF and what he intended, and it Graphic. is a soft G. Graphic. Yeah, but the guy who invented it Gra Graphic. pronounces it GIF. Graphic. Doesn't matter. He invented it. He gets to choose. Graphic. GIF. And The GIF? creator of, of GIF, GIF says it's pronounced GIF, but he is wrong. No. Says Gizmodo. Yeah, who the fuck is Gizmodo? Nobody, because they don't want it to be Gizmodo, because that'd be a weird name. <laughs> Gizmodo, that would be hilarious. Yeah. There's actually a website called How to Really Pronounce GIF. And it's GIF. It's pronounced with a hard They're G. They're wrong. Like GIF, like GIF. We're going with the inventor of the GIF. This GIF. is an existential conversation that... Like, that everyone is wrong and... who says GIF. Do you also deliver for me to one when asked for it? I don't do deals anymore. <laughs> Where's our lunch? <laughs> uh, I'm literally, that's what I was pulling my phone to check. It's nine minutes away. <laughs> Joseph is on the way with our order. Oh, good for Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> but how Finally do you, so, okay, so, so let's, let's talk this out. Okay. How do you create a course on responding with the proper gifts? It's all about knowing which terms to search. Right, so you have to think about how you would respond. And usually in a three or four word maximum sentence. And then you search for that sentence and, and then you like scroll one, two through the really, gifts. And one or two one. is really the key. Words? Yeah. Okay. You don't want to go three or four because then it confuses the system. And the real one is just having enough pop culture knowledge mm -hmm. that I rarely search for the term. I search for a character that I know has had a response that I want. Sometimes I do that. And sometimes it's really just what the, the actual gif is actually showing. Gif. Gif. Yeah, Jeff. Definitely Jeff. <laughs> Actually, sound off in the comments. Yes! Jeff yeah. or Jeff? Let us know. Comment you, below. No, yeah, depending on the platform, it's probably down here. It might be there. It might be there. 
It'd be weird if it was up there. It's probably down here. <laughs> Where the GIFs live. Hard G or soft G? Respond with a GIF and let us know. Who do you think's gonna win? Obviously I'm gonna win, it's my show. <laughs> You're I right. have deleting capability <laughs> on all comments. A lot of my haters are watching this right now, so they're gonna say Check out this bitch. just because. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, we've said hard and soft too many times. <laughs> okay, what's next? Let's talk about something else that's helpful for people. Huh. <laughs> Seems like it's such an easy thing to discuss. Recruiting. Oh God, I hate that. Really? Yes. Do you recruit? Yes. Okay, so. But by force, not by choice. <laughs> Fucking hate my job. <laughs> so, <coughs> here's the dilemma in the industry. You make money by having more agents in your office. How do you deal with the quantity versus quality dilemma? And it's Jeff. <laughs> you know, I think, like, I honestly think that it's, um, it's, it's very comparable to how realtors do business. Um, it's not about how many people you can add to your database or how many seats you can fill. It really is about the quality of those people. So like real estate coaches talk to realtors about making sure that you understand your ideal audience and your ideal client and then figuring out how to go after that person and how to lock that person into loyalty. And I feel like the same rings true when you're recruiting into your brokerage. Like I, I don't want to just fill um, pulseless people into seats in my branch. Like that's not what I want to do. Like I want to continue to grow the culture that is already established there to provide camaraderie and, um, um, value to the realtors that already make that branch amazing by bringing more people in that fit within that, 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 that ideal, that, that dynamic. So how do you identify this is an agent I want? So I feel like a lot of that has to do with the reason why my brokerage hired me which is, um, oh, they're close. Four minutes. Um, because I am a direct representation of a lot of that dynamic that's already in my branch that they want to continue to grow. So the, the, the recruiting that I do is, pretty, is really organic and it's really magnetic. Mm -hmm. The people that want to work with me are a certain type of people that will also be a really good fit for that branch. Until they find out you pronounce a GIF and then... I have none of those people because they all come in and it's part of my interview process and they go, oh. Oh, you are wrong. It's GIF. So I'm going to go to the other Royal page. That never happens. No. They're like, yes, it's GIF. Not happening. <laughs> GIF. GIF. Y you have sweaty armpits. It's true. <laughs> the sweatiest. <laughs> you can't see it, but if you ever have the distinct displeasure of being on the show. Well, it's a thing in, in your in your episodes, though, where yeah, people no, identify. So you actually people. watch them. Yes. Yeah. So I'm always surprised when people tell me they watched entire episodes. No, I do. they're so long. I, I put them on while I'm working, so I don't necessarily sit there like this the whole time mm -hmm. watching the episode, but I listen I prefer if you did. I, I listen <laughs> Just like, really. Yeah. It'd be great. But, oh, it's, yeah. I've now mentioned it on like seven or eight different episodes, but normally I'm the one bringing it up, so it's great. Well, I noticed it before it was ever brought up. Really? Yeah, I noticed I brought, it. I and noticed then it was brought up and I was like, yes! So I was on, it was actually episode eight, The Ocho, um, with Drew and Heather. And I had to take a bathroom. That was a good episode. I watched that whole thing. I had to take a bathroom break. And when I came back, Drew's like, do you know she have pit stains? <laughs> and I can forever not unsee that. <laughs> and our food is here. Lunch. So over a pint turned into over wings. This is how you know it's a good episode. This is actually a over a pint first mm -hmm. that we, an hour into an episode, ordered food, <laughs> had it delivered. Is that a first? Yeah. So mm -hmm. the only other time I ordered food with a guest, I think was Tony, which is recently, but it was after we even stopped filming and then he came and we had dinner with our family. So you're going to have to do some epic editing where we like crack our first pint, talk about some crap, then mouse some wings, talk about some crap. Oh, we go chronological. I do very little editing. Hmm. I basically just edit out Rico violations and where I look stupid. I have to say, I was laughing when I was watching your Tony Iacovello episode when you fast forwarded at the end with all the geeky stuff. Mm -hmm. That was so funny. Not the first time I did that. Hmm. Do you know the other episode? Let's see if she actually watches. No, I don't. David Greenspan. You're on a 15 minute Leaf and Raptor binge. <laughs> 
And I fast forwarded through David and I talking about the Leafs and Raptors. Although Tony's episode was the first where I interlaid a graphic of what we were talking about on the screen. That was good, and mm -hmm. I enjoyed that. And I thought that that fit well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the non geeky people watching, it's what we do. So I'm wondering what you're going to be fast forwarding through here and then what you're going to put on the bottom. <laughs> Probably most of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not true. This is actually a good episode. Plus, now they get, we might fast forward through this. <laughs> Watch me <laughs> suck back this wind. <laughs> And just like, <laughs> eat it dry. <laughs> At least if it's fast forward, then we'll see the food on our face. Yeah. Oh my god, these are delicious. Right? <laughs> if you're eating ribs and doing a Harry Carry, there's a problem. Would you eat the moon if it were made of ribs? <laughs> Heck, I know I would. but brings down the house with Kermit the Frog with syphilis. Oh! <laughs> with oh, these are good. Look at that. Is that keto? No. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's the weekend, I'm allowed. No, you're fat. <laughs> uh, you know what the best part is right now? This is considered work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> hey, how was that thing with um, Park Bench, with Grant, what's his face from Park Bench, oh. that, that prop tech thing? Uh, it was interesting. Um, so like, we have people there like me who are obviously heavily invested in the industry and agents. They had a guy there who was basically seemed like he was willing to bet his life on the fact that agents would be gone in three to five years. That was his assertion that but agents are irrelevant and they won't exist in three or five years. Isn't there some potential that that could happen? There's still travel agents. Yeah. So, yeah. The agent population could be severed quite a bit in the nice little culling, but there's no way they're all going to be gone. Maybe 25 years, but even then I doubt it. So yeah, this is over a pint. And wings. Yeah, and really took a weird mode. Car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I always knew it would be a good episode. It's some golden nuggets today though. Yeah. I think. I think so. Yeah. Okay, but drop a golden nugget before you turn it off. That's inappropriate. <laughs> so this has been the latest episode of Over a Pint. Um, Sandra, if people want to get a hold of you to perhaps work for you at your brokerage. <laughs> Nobody wants to work for me at this point. For the gift pronouncing people who are wrong and would like to be around other people who are wrong about important matters in life. Sandra's here. How do they get a hold of you? You know I'm a token bitch, right? Yeah. So, how do they get a hold of you? Um, S. Kirkland or EarlyPage.ca, 416-797-8003, or Facebook is preferable, where you can drop me a gif. And you can comment about that here, or here, <laughs> or here, or here. <laughs> and we'll be good to go. So thank Andrew, you for coming on. Andrew, drop a golden nugget before we go. is. <laughs>